all right we are live welcome guys welcome to the journey within this is a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of a death and rebirth and today I, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to interview someone that uh, someone i respect and admire someone that is making some some serious big moves and uh, we can definitely see his his impact on a lot of different coaches and so uh kevin welcome to the journey within and appreciate you coming on man hello hello thank you so much for having me justin studio yeah. viewers thank you for tuning in and yeah. yeah i've died and rebirthed a lot so let's dive right into <laughs> let's, it let's yeah well let's let's talk about that man so so maybe actually before we we get into that you know um how would you describe like who you are and what you do Shit, man. So I would describe myself the same way I would describe everybody else, which is multidimensional as, are we swearing on this? Do we swear on this? It's fine, dude. <laughs> <laughs> multidimensional <laughs> as fuck. I think that we are all incredibly multifaceted beings who have the capability of being whoever we want to be. And from that, we will proceed to do whatever it is we want to do and have whatever it is that we want to have. So that's me. I try to stay away from labels. Um, that's probably not a very like helpful description. So I'll tell you at <laughs> age 29 on October 31st, happy Halloween, by the way. Um, I am a spiritual business mentor. I am a conscious money coach. That was the one we came up with the other day. I help people increase their abundance consciousness, expand their awareness of their own sovereignty within their own existence, their ability to choose the life that they want and create, you know, the experience that they want to live. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a freaking amazing plan there. Um, when when you say, I want to go back to this multidimensional, what would you say? Multidimensional. Multidimensional AF. AF. Yeah. What, like, when you say that, what do you mean? Are you talking about like, are we like, we're spiritual beings? Like, what does multidimensional mean in this context? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, a really good quote that I love is we are not we're not physical beings who s sometimes have spiritual experiences. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience, right? So what we are, who we are, the consistency of our being is greater and deeper than, you know, the, our skin, like it's deeper than the surface. Mm -hmm. We are more than the summation of our 206 bones in our skeleton, right? So yes, we are deeply spiritual, deeply energetic beings. And so when I say multidimensional, I mean, we're existing on a spiritual level, we're existing on an energetic level, we're existing on a vibratory level, a frequency level, an emotional level, a logical level, a reasoning level, a mental, physical, you know, every sort of level, romantic level, financial level, like we all exist across all of these different fields. And the only way to like bring about balance in our lives is to recognize that, to recognize that we do exist multidimensionally so that we don't put too much attention on any one of these different fields or wavelengths or however you want to describe it, because that leads to imbalance. If we care too much, we make one area of our life too, too, too much more important than the other areas. Yeah. So it's almost like, um, I guess, not being attached or averted to any one type of, I guess, area of life. Is that yeah. kind of... I think that's yeah. a, a perfectly apt way to describe it. Yeah. Practicing detachment from any specific thing and practicing awareness of the totality got you well i'd love to get into your story man you know these deaths and rebirths multiple you said you have multiple deaths and rebirths as many uh, as it takes yeah yeah maybe you share just a, like a little bit about your story and like what you know brought you here to being this conscious money coach yeah so the uh standard overview of my story is when i was i was born in california shouts out I was born in the Bay Area, Walnut Creek, uh, to Michael Chin and Beverly Leahy slash Chin. Um, love my parents. My parents have always been my best friends, my biggest heroes, my confidants. And uh, I'm an only child, so I'm very, very close to them. When I was eight years old, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so there was a point where we thought that maybe she wasn't going to make it. She did make it. She's a survivor. Thanks for asking. Wow. Um, but when I was like eight, nine years old, it was like, oh shit, like, is Bev going to make it? Is this going to, is this going to be the end of Bev? And when that was her experience, she felt it proper for me 
to deepen my spiritual experience. She was like, your father's not going to teach you this shit. He's, he's the man. He's got his finances down. He's a great, great guy, very wise. He's not spiritual. He's not in touch with a lot of these other, again, dimensionalities um, to life. So she was, she was like, you need, you need to be, if I die, I need to pass this on to you. So she had me reading like um, the very first work I ever read in this field was um, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth and The Power of Now. But she had me reading Eckhart. She had me reading Deepak Chopra. She had me reading Alan Watts when I was, yeah, in fourth grade. And so that was- In what grade? uh, Fourth grade. Seriously? Yeah. And you can understand this in the fourth grade. Yeah. So she was, she is a teacher and my dad is- Asian, I'm Asian, so it's kind of like you know, you know how yeah, it is. I, I was, got you. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. I was into, I was very into reading. I was very um, apt at learning. I was, I was very, I loved picking up new information even from a very early age. And so, yeah, I was, I was comprehending it. I was getting a lot out of it. And the moral of of the first chapter of this story is, from a very, very early age, while I was in elementary school, I began to realize that there was more to life than what meets the eye. There was more going on than what I could see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. There was deeper truths than the words that I was receiving, right? That what my teachers were saying or my neighbors were saying or like the things that were going on in my life, there was something behind them, behind the veil or deeper than that surface level. So that happened right and so then i you know progressing a little bit more my mother uh goes into remission she heals and we're like living we're we're chilling everything's cool and then when i was like 10 11 years old it was like the summer between summer after seventh grade so i was probably like 11 um i started smoking weed so i smoked i smoked marijuana for the first time with my friend's older sister and that was like like just again, the doors had just been blown open. I was like, you know, all of this shit is a lie. Everything they told us is wrong. Huh. We're being manipulated. We're being controlled. We're living in the matrix, like all this kind of stuff. Because I was like, why? You know, I was told that drugs were bad. And yet here I am, like experiencing new levels of awareness and consciousness and understanding within myself and of the world around me after, you know, lighting this flower on fire and, and inhaling this substance. <laughs> so I began to question everything so again this is me as like an 11 12 year old i'm in middle school like developing big issues with authority um not like like keeping it really low key because i wasn't like a trouble child i wasn't like acting out i wasn't like doing all sorts of shit i was still getting great grades i was playing tennis like i was still like this idyllic son that my parents had always wanted but the whole time i was like this is just a game I'm just playing the game right now. Like I'm just kind of like biding my time, waiting for the opportunity to bust out of this game. And often I would bust out of this game via like, you know, going on adventures with my friends or getting high with my friends or whatever, anything like that. Um, And so that progressed along. The next big turning point I would say was when I was 16, my best friend died. I don't know if you've seen these tattoos, but I have like, I can't get a good angle on this. Um, it's, it says M A G on my forearm. It was the very first tattoo I got. Um, and it's for Michael Anthony Gaines. So my best friend died when I was 16 and it was like, again, just another glimpse through the, the matrix of like life, right? Like, because if there's life after death, then death isn't the end. And if, and if there's more to life than being alive, then clearly there's like a lot of stuff that we're not talking about, right? I don't know if I explained that very well. Yeah, I, I got to ask. So when when your best friend died, and I'm sure that was like a very just grieving process. Did you did that strengthen your belief in like in in the spiritual and like an afterlife? And you fe- like I'm wondering if maybe a part of you felt like a peace that you knew that like he's in a better place and I'm going to see him again. Yeah, no question. I mean as a 16 year old, like there was an immense amount of anger and frustration and sorrow and, and grief. But yes, I immediately, you know, prior to his death, I always thought everything happened for a reason. Right. Mm. And then that was the belief that was really shaken at the event of his death was like, why he's such a great guy. Why is his mother have to lose her child? Like, you know, how could this be happening for a reason? What is the reason here? But ultimately it did increase my faith because after you know after like six months it wasn't immediate 
But I eventually came to a place of like, okay, Kevin, everything can happen for a reason. And you don't always have to know what the reason is. You don't always have to understand the way that God is working or the universe is working or whatever you want to describe it as. And you can still trust that everything is happening for a reason. So ultimately, that experience did strengthen my faith. Interesting. Do you do you see it differently now? Or, am I, or, or, or let me ask a different question. I know at that time you didn't know the reason. Do you think you know the reason now as you look back on it? I'm curious. That's a good question. Um, I haven't I haven't found any sort of logical reason in terms of like, oh, because A, now B. Like he died so that I could whatever. But uh, again, I do trust that the reasoning is there. It was all part of a greater harmony. And in my own personal life, it has just become a matter of like, I'm living for two now. I want to have twice the beautiful experiences, go twice as many places, eat twice as many food, like date twice as many wonderful women and, you know, make twice as much money, change twice as many, two times as many lives, like all of these things, because yeah. I truly feel that like his spirit lives within me, everything that he stood for and everything that he was is carried out through my day to day actions. Yeah. You think that's what what's been driving you and, and has driven, drove, driven you to to create this business hell yeah big part of it for sure um not just his death but like death in general um so the the fun fact statistic about kevin chin one of them is i went to eight funerals before i ever went to a wedding so Jeez, bro. i have yeah i've experienced quite a bit of death at, the, at this point in my life i've been to like more than 20 funerals and i just attribute that to the fact that like i have a large network you know it's i have i've been blessed with the opportunity to connect deeply with a lot of people. Death is a natural part of life. And so I've, you know, ended up at a lot of funerals. But I think about death constantly. It's a, it's a, it is the motivating force in my life. There's a 21 pilots line that's like, um, death inspires me like a dog inspires a rabbit. And I definitely feel that because it's like, you know, it's, we're all going to die. Every last one of us is yeah. going to die. Every single person. If you take nothing from this, understand that you're going to die. <laughs> you and you and everybody Great. you love is going to die one day. And so it's like with that knowledge and with that like conceptual understanding taken to an experiential level of like, fuck, I really am going to die. It's like you have to wake up every day as if it could be your last. As if your father mm -hmm. could die today, your mother could die today, your best friend could die today, your lover, your partner, anybody could die today. So it's like you got to leave it all on the table. You can't spend a day doing things that are out of alignment with your highest self that, you know, you can't spend a day doing things that make you suffer as a means to an end to something else because you could get hit by a bus tomorrow, right? So yes, his death and death in general, the understanding of, of my own mortality has been the most, like the biggest factor in, in um, my motivating, the biggest motivating force. Oh. For everything that I've done from this coaching thing to music before that to like, you know, helping. I was working with uh, I was working with teenagers when I was a teenager. So like the, so the, the next the next big thing after uh, Mike's death was Challenge Day. There's this program called Challenge Day. The mission statement of Challenge Day is for to create a world where every child feels safe, loved and celebrated. I, that resonated deeply with me when they did Challenge Day at my school. I fell in love with it. I formed the Be the Change Club at my school. Um, we got national recognition because my school is fucking dope and it, it, like, there was a lot of money there and it like it ended up being like a big thing. Um, and then I got asked to be on the board of directors for this national program. And I was like, fuck, yeah, this is amazing. So at 17, I was doing that and I was like working with kids all over the country and like helping, you know, steer the direction of this company. And that was really cool. And then I went to college and had a lot of shenanigans. I don't think that anything that I did in college was really relevant to like this conversation other than I just had a lot of fucking fun and realized yeah. that like, you know, life could really be as easy as you wanted it to be. I think that being in college taught me a level of independence, right? Because college is such a magical place for a lot of people. Um, I know that not everybody had this experience. And so I'm just, I'm speaking from my own experience, but for me, college was like everything was handled. My parents paid oh. for everything. I didn't have to worry about my own tuition. I didn't have to work. Like all I had to do was go to class and party. 
And so, <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. again, I, I am acknowledging that not, not everybody is, you know, ha, has fortunate enough to have that particular experience, but it did get me into this vibratory state of, you know, my world takes care of me. I am supported. I am allowed to be supported. I am allowed to receive. I'm allowed to let things be this easy. And yet I can still focus on creating the things that I want to create, make the impact that I want to make. I don't have to be lazy about it, right? Like, um, I don't think anybody sees me as like a silver spoon kind of guy. And when I say that, you know, like I, I have been supported financially by a lot of different parties, like it's, it neither comes as a surprise nor as like a, you know, it's not like, oh, obviously like Kevin's such a lazy piece of shit. Like obviously <laughs> he's had everything yeah. handed to him, but it's also not like, oh yeah, like, wow, I really thought, you know, Kevin has this air of hardship and struggle about him, right? So it's, I feel like I've really done a good job of, riding that line and role modeling for people who have had a lot of opportunities that it's okay to capitalize on those opportunities and really fucking go for it. And you, you know, use the step ups that steps up that you've been given and the things that you've been handed to help other people, right? You know, I know a lot of people who feel guilty about the things that they've, they've grown up with, you know, like people with yeah. oil money or their parents are like head of pharmaceutical companies and stuff. And they feel guilty about it. There's like a level of shame around like, oh, everything's been so easy for me. I've always had money to support myself and da 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 And it's like, now you just sound like a fucking fool because it's like, you've been given all these things that other people would kill for yeah, yeah. and you're squandering them. So I think um, a big part of, you know, what I represent in this digital space is like to use the opportunities that you've been giving. And if you haven't been given opportunities, make them for yourself. Keep your hand on the door so that when opportunity knocks, like you're ready to capitalize. Yeah. You know, I actually kind of relate to that. Um, not that like my parents were like rich or anything, um, but, you know, I grew up like pretty comfortable. You know, they were Asian. So generally speaking, you know, they made like decent, like middle class. Right. So it's like not like I had to worry about like, man, when am, where where's my next meal going to come from and and things like that, you know. So like things were like fairly easy in that sense they never like we never really had to struggle with money you know um or at least they didn't they didn't show it mm -hmm. right so I, I i do relate to that to where i kind of feel like oh man i've you know in a sense i've been fed, fed the silver spoon and i kind of feel ashamed about that they're like children starving in africa and what am i what am i doing you know like um so no i get that man but but the way the reasoning that you just said is like yeah like dude capitalize on it rather than uh, shaming shaming yourself right yeah because that's like not helping anybody that. you're not yeah, yeah. you're not helping children in africa by feeling guilty yeah but if you were to use these opportunities to build programs amass money that you could donate you know start philanthropic organizations like then you really can do something about it and you can really help people and that's what we're all here to do right and, and i think that the guilt is just misplaced love right it's it's like wishing that you could love people and affect people in a positive way, but not knowing how to. And it's like, you got to just let go of that shit and focus on what you can do for others, who you can be that will make an impact in somebody's life. I like that, man. It's a good reframe. Unfocused love. I think that all, I think that all guilt, all fear, all shame, all, I think that everything is love point blank period. I'll say it right here, right now. I think that everything is love. I think that there's only one frequency throughout this existence throughout this universe and i think that everything that doesn't look like love is just distorted love everything that seems like it's something else is just you know a misinterpretation of love and when you frame it that way it's like you get to approach all situations and all people with more compassion because you're like oh it's okay you're just a little bit confused or if i'm feeling you know if i'm feeling shitty if i'm feeling sad or depressed or whatever it's like oh, i'm just confused right now you know i just i just kind of lost touch with it it's fine that, okay, so how do we, so for, for someone that's that's gone through some hardships and like you've, you've been through a ton, which I would love to hear about how you how you kind of came back from that. But for like people who are, they're hearing that like everything is love. Well, it doesn't feel like it, it doesn't look like it. You know, how do we, how do we actually get to that, uh, that place? Yeah, so I just want to start by saying like, I trigger the fuck out of people on the internet. My whole brand is like, guess what? Your life doesn't have to be as complicated as you've made it. And I tend to break things down into ways that are so simple that people have to really look in the mirror and say, okay, I'm either going to let it be this simple 
or I'm going to say, fuck Kevin, there's no way that it could be that simple. There's no way that I struggled this long for nothing, right? So I do often trigger people on the internet. I had a post earlier this month that was like, um, you, you are what you attract. So you might as well accept the fact that you're a walking miracle and let that show up in your life, right? Super, super positive, optimistic, yeah. like meant nothing but love. And people got upset with it. They're like, no, because I had this happen in my life or like this happened to me or I had this, you know, and it's just like, how does that account? How do you, how does your love model account for all that? And I'm like, oh man, this is just a tweet. Like I didn't really want <laughs> for it to like go into all this shit. But um, yeah, so all that said, to bring it back to your original question, it all comes down to shifting your vibration. And when I say shift your vibration, I do not mean teleport your vibration. People talk a lot, especially lately about quantum leaping. I don't have anything against quantum leaping. I, it, I've experienced it myself. I've watched it happen to people. And for those who don't aren't familiar with quantum leaping, that's when you like are, are in, you fall asleep in Paris and you wake up in Peru, right? It's like everything changes immediately, which yeah. is a, again, a quantum property of our physical universe. It can happen. Electrons can like teleport electrons, you know, light years apart from each other can affect each other. But to bring it back to like systems and techniques that you can use and harness today, shifting your vibration incrementally. So if you are feeling depressed, guilty, ashamed, anything like that. And um, the, the chart to look at here is by, oh God, what is it? What was is it Hawkins? Name? Yes, thank you so yeah. much. That was gonna Boom. fuck me up. David R. <laughs> Hawkins is the guy who has this map of consciousness, right? So it has like what we would describe as emotions listed out and it's cool, it's color coded, all that good stuff. But he says, they're not so much emotions as they are frequencies of consciousness. So you have like the ultimate consciousness, like enlightenment, you talk about these like, um, you know, avatars of, of enlightenment, like Jesus or Zoroaster or the Buddha or like people like that, right? They reach this level where they're just at this like ultra high frequency of consciousness. Then below that you have like bliss or joy or peace or ecstasy. And beneath that you have like acceptance and willingness and beneath that you have anger and resentment and beneath that you have like sorrow and sadness and then it goes it goes down the scale to like the bottom is like guilt and shame and then quick side note the difference between guilt and shame guilt happens when you are guilty about something you did or something you're doing right i broke my friend's nintendo and i feel guilty about it shame happens when you feel guilty about who you are or yep. what you are i am a destroyer right so shame is actually the worst it's the worst yeah. than guilt it's when you are upset with yourself for being yourself right so that's the very fucking bottom let's say that you are experiencing shame you can incrementally shift from shame to guilt to sorrow to sadness to acceptance to happiness to da 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 right and so like the quantum leap it's always possible but it's not the most reliable option if you want to like focus on doing this as like a day-to-day -day exercise you want to you want to work on doing it incrementally and you're probably asking now like, okay, so how do I do it, right? How do I go from shame to guilt? How do I go from guilt to anger? And you do this by harnessing the power of your thoughts, your thoughts, bum, bum, your bum. beliefs, your attitudes, your perspectives. The basis of all of this work is understanding that you create your own reality, that you select your own experience, that you choose what it feels like to be you. You choose what the things in your life happening mean to your experience right if i knock over my water bottle i have my switch right in front of me so i just keep talking about nintendo shouts out if i knock over my water bottle and it spills on my switch i could be like god i'm such a fucking idiot i hate myself why do i always do this or i could be like oh let me just run I, i'm capable and confident that i can handle this let me just run and go get a towel real quick and dry it off and hopefully fix it oh my god even if it's broken like my friend knows how to fix nintendos or i can take it to the store or i can you know, I, I'm financially stable enough to buy a new one, right? So it's like the way that you think, react, decide, choose, feel, like all of this stuff, these are the tools with which you control your frequency. And in controlling your frequency, like that's synonymous with controlling your level of consciousness per the graph that David R. Hawkins has. I wish I could like bring it up right now. Um, and then, yeah, you experience different emotions based on that. So if you want to go from guilt 
to anger, you just shift it from like, God, I suck so much. I hate myself to I'm upset that I did this. I made a mistake, right? And you can, you can probably feel even just as I say that, the difference there, right? Between I hate myself and yeah. I made a mistake, right? Huge. Because then from I made a mistake, you can move into someday I will forgive myself, right? Which is more like sadness, right? Like someday I will forgive myself. I will get over this eventually, right? You know, maybe tomorrow will be better, maybe next week. And then from there it can be like, well, I could forgive myself now, or I'm really up, still upset with this and I'm not happy with myself right now, but I accept the situation. It did happen. I'm no longer resisting it. I'm not like replaying that moment in my mind over and over like, fuck, I wish that happened differently. So now you're at like a stage of acceptance. And then you can start to move into stages of like, maybe this is happening for a reason. Maybe I wasn't supposed to play Metroid today. Maybe this is a good sign that I need to get outside and go enjoy some sunlight. And so mm. then you start to move into a place more and more of like, happiness and again you could like, you could probably hear it just in my voice like describing these things the world begins to open up when david r hawkins describes it it's like a it's like a linear just like breakdown chart it's a rectangle but truthfully it works like this when you're feeling shame and you're existing in a state of shame you're at this like pinpointed area where you don't allow yourself to any mobility through your own existence you're stuck right here like i'm just a fuck up and i suck and that's all there is to it right and as soon as you get to higher and higher levels, you're like, okay, I'm angry. You know, maybe I'm I'm mad at myself for doing these things, but like I could be mad at myself here. I could go be mad at myself over there. I could go like get some ice cream to try to make myself feel better, like whatever, right? And the more and more you elevate to higher levels of consciousness, the more your reality expands. By the time you're in a place of like, you know, I love myself, you're like, holy fuck, anything is possible. I can do anything. It doesn't matter how many switches I destroy because <laughs> I love myself and like anything is possible for me as long as I allow it into my existence. As long as I allow it into my experience, it's mine. Yeah, the, no, that, that, that switch thing was funny. So uh, go, going back to, you know, you, you have these two tragedies in your life and now you're in college. Um, you know, you have these beliefs that, hey, look, you're taken care of. It's OK. You can still go to school and party. Where do you think the shift from there to now? Well, like, what was the biggest shift there? And what do you think caused that? Yeah, so we can just keep going with the story for sure. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, so in college, I was. Let's just fucking say it. No one's going to come after me. I, that was 10 years ago. I was selling drugs. I was selling drugs oh my in gosh, college. Kevin, how I was dare selling you? drugs and even even more illegal than selling drugs, I was selling alcohol. And I won't get into the details oh. of all this, but like how is selling alcohol more illegal than selling drugs? It just it's kind of weird. Because because it's taxable. Like oh. if you if you sell marijuana and ecstasy, they just put you in jail. If you sell Jack Daniels, then Jack Daniels comes after you. Oh, dude! It's, it's actually okay. yeah. There's actually more. You. There's actually more ramifications to selling alcohol. Um, so strange since prohibition. Yes, what life's fucking weird. But anyways, I started to, to develop an entrepreneurial mindset when I was in college um, by providing services and goods to people <laughs> who were in need of them. Right? Um, yeah. So then, fast forward there. I graduated. I moved down to Los Angeles. I was working at a record label for a while. And that was cool, but I realized, like, like I went to school for music. And so I, I moved down. I was working at a record label, and it wasn't really working out for me. I decided to come back home. I moved in with my dad, and I was working at a studio in Berkeley, uh, the same studio that Green Day recorded Dookie, just oh. for a fun fact. Um, so I was working at this studio. It was cool. I was meeting a lot of people. I was making a bunch of connections. I was, like, having fun with it. But artists have a lot of different personalities and personalities come with personality conflicts and i just kept running into walls where it was like my vision wasn't really getting expressed and so i decided like fuck it i'm just gonna do it all myself so i was like 22 years old i was like i'm gonna be the guy and so then i went on this just like this was the first time in my life i got like really focused because before that it was like school had always been pretty easy for me i was never really like worried about it I was more focused on like girls, to be honest. Um, but at this point, I was like 22 and I got really focused. I got a job bartending 
And in the beginning, I was bartending one day a week and living at my dad's house. And the, all the rest of my time, like six, 10 hours a day was dedicated to producing music. I learned how to play piano. I started practicing singing. I had always like written songs, but I like really started like releasing them myself. And I did that for about two years. And when I was 24, we signed a record deal. We fucking Ooh. did it. The dream was accomplished. Everything I ever wanted had come true. And it was fun for like six months. And mm. then it, it got to a point where it was just like, it just became another job. Like it just became work. It became like, again, like I didn't feel like my artistic vision was being expressed. It was like too much of like trying to cater to what the label wanted to use me to make money for, which is kind of just the name of the game. It's nothing against them. Um, but then that was a pivotal moment because I realized that this is going to sound pretty cliche, but I realized that the journey is everything. I realized that there is no destination. I realized that as soon as you get to the place that you've always wanted to be, it's smoke, right? Like there, there is no top of the mountain in, in real life. If you climb to the top of the mountain, any hiker or, or summiter knows this, you get to the top of the mountain, you have a moment of reprise. You're like, holy fuck, this is awesome. I'm so proud of myself but you don't just live on the top of the mountain for the rest of your <laughs> life, right? Like you climb back down, you go climb another mountain. Right. So it was, it was the exact same thing. I reached this point where I was like, holy shit, like I, I made it. Um, but then it, it wasn't made. And my father had a stroke. Uh, he had a brain aneurysm and had to get surgery. He survived too. Thanks for asking. Um, but I was like living in the hospital with him for a while and I just totally abdicated all of my duties to the record label. I was like, I'm not doing these shows. I'm not showing up for these events. Like I'm not doing any of this stuff. And they dropped me. So I'm actually a, I'm actually a, a failed rock star in the flesh. <laughs> um, but then after that happened, I went and I lived with my dad for a little bit again. I moved back in with my dad again um, and took care of him for like a couple months. And then after that, it was like, okay, I'm not bartending anymore. I'm not doing music professional anymore. Who am I? Who am I and what am I doing? So I started, I think I did the, I did the ceremonies first. So I did a couple ayahuasca ceremonies because I was like, this is, this is my path. This is the next yeah. step. And then that was like everything just like sky opened up and rained down like all of the ecstasy and all of the fear and all of the torment and all of the plague but also all of the the goodness like just everything it was like heaven and hell at the same time um oh and taught me taught me more in that you know those couple days than i had ever learned in the whole rest of my life and so then i was even more fucked because i was like now fucking what like i went from a place of like now what to like oh good lord now what <laughs> Like, you would think that ayahuasca like would have given you the answer right well it's like the the best analogy like the best way i can describe it is like in that fourth indiana jones movie when she touches the crystal skull or even in the first indiana jones movie when they when they, the raiders of the lost ark when they open the ark and it's like everybody just gets fucking obliterated like that's what it was like really so it's like you experience these levels of like truth and wisdom and whatnot but it's like again like to go back to the the ladder of like consciousness it's like if you're down here and you experience up here it's like it doesn't help you connect the fucking dots yeah right? dude no that i'm kind of glad you said that because i've i've experienced i've never done ayahuasca but i've experienced these like high states of like love like just amazing like it felt like i was channeling christ like it, it was like crazy and i couldn't sustain that mm -hmm. and i just crashed like i dropped and it, it was yeah it's it was like a huge high and then i just a huge crash and like yeah you're right like i couldn't really like connect the dots i'm like i don't how do i get back up there you know it's yeah so i'm kind of glad you said that anyways yeah hell yeah and like i had done so much like dmt and lsd and like other other um psychedelics other other ways of like altering and expanding my consciousness previously that i feel like i integrated it a lot better than a lot of people do because i watched like some other people like just just fall apart they're like i have yeah. to quit my job and just like fucking go live in the woods now like i can't even you know but it's really like that you really get the sense of again like all of none of this is real what's the fucking point of any of this 
But anyways, I took that and was as positive with it as possible. I mean, it does like clean you out. So you feel amazing, even though you're like more confused than ever. Um, and so I was like, well, what do you do when you feel amazing you and you're confused? You go travel. So I went and I started traveling. I went to Europe. I went to Southeast Asia. I went all over the place. I spent like, I don't know, five, six months just like on the road, living out of a backpack. Fucking nice. dope. Most fun I've ever had in my whole life. I highly recommend it for anybody. Out of all these things that I've talked about doing, you know, like signing record deals and doing ayahuasca, like do it if you do it if you feel called, but like traveling, I highly recommend it. I think everybody should do it. I think everybody on this planet should serve tables at least once, like work in the service industry, because then you really get what it's like to like be on the other side of the glass, right? And like, you know, help people. And everybody should travel. Everybody should go outside of their comfort zone, experience other cultures and, you know, see the world to whatever degree that they choose. So anyways, I was like traveling a whole bunch. Um, my friend, my best friend, Rick shouts out was like, we should get a place together. We've been best friends since we were little kids and we've never lived together. We should get a place. How about Seattle? And I was like, how about it, dude? I'm in, I'm in Thailand right now. Like I'm down for whatever. So I come back, move to Seattle keep bartending because it's all I know how to do. I'm there for about a year. I decide to go traveling again. I get restless. I go to India to go do my yoga teacher training in Rishikesh. That was amazing. Beautiful experience. And, you know, there's, there's a couple more deaths that I haven't even listed in here that, you know, I don't know, didn't, didn't fall into today's narrative, but there was a death that happened while I was in India that shook me to my core. He was a lot younger. Um, he was like 19 years old and it just like, it hurt me. It hurt me a lot. It affected me deeply. And I kept traveling cause I wasn't even ready to go home yet. I wasn't ready to like see my family. Um, you know, this guy was, was family to me. And when I finally did, it was like, everything was different. I came back in like March, 20, 20. So the pandemic had started. Yeah. The, uh, you know, I've gotten in trouble for this too. I've called them the BLM riots. I realize now that that is harmful rhetoric because they were not BLM riots. Um, there were BLM protests and there was Capitol Hill riots. But, you know, without getting too caught up in, in my verbiage, the point is that shit was fucked in my neighborhood, <laughs> right? like lit my dumpster on fire i watched people get what shot shit? outside my building like everywhere got looted every building that didn't get boarded up got looted the police like they ran the police out of the police station that's what they called it like the autonomous zone because it was like this neighborhood was no it was a no longer police state so then people started getting killed and stuff it was horrible and all of that was happening in the midst of this depression from this you know like a family member dying wow so I felt like even after all of this, even after everything I had learned and all of these ecstatic states I had reached and, you know, this like, like, as you described it, like Christ consciousness that I had experienced at one point, you know, I went to yoga school and practiced asana for like six hours a day, meditation for like two hours a day, ate nothing but like vegan foods for like two months. Yet I wasn't Anakin Skywalker, right? Or I was still Anakin Skywalker. I did not have the power to like stop people from dying. I did not have the power to like save the world. Yeah. And what happened was I was like, this is when we met. This is right around the time that, that you and I met and I had started putting together my first program to like help people with anxiety and depression. And I was sitting in my room and outside the window, there was like a protest happening that turned into a riot as they often did. Again, no blame towards the BLM movement. It was just the general caucus of shit that was happening in Capitol Hill. Um, but this woman, like there was like a line of like police officers with like riot shields and stuff. And she like ran past them um, for no reason other than defiance from what I could see. She turns back around to like shout some sort of like, cha -cha -cha -cha, like fucking whatever. And this police officer pivots and just blasts her in the chest point blank with, you know, he was like a, a beanbag gun, but it was like, oh. you know, like a two, a two handed like weapon. And she was probably eight ten feet away and it just hit her in the chest i from my window like heard her sternum crack and then she just crumpled to the ground instantly and so then all hell breaks loose and all these people are starting to like try to rush her and the police like form a shield around her and they're like you know let us let us get her help like she needs a medic like all this shit like 
And I'm just like sitting in front of the window. I start bawling, start just crying my eyes out. I'm like, what the fuck is even happening? I start filming it. And then I'm like, what am I doing filming it? Who am I going to show this to? Like, what, who, how is this going to help? What do I even do right now? Yeah. And I realized in that moment that if I really wanted to help people, I needed a better vantage point. I couldn't be in the shit trying to pull people out of the shit. And that's when I decided to move to the mountains. So then I moved out here where I am currently, Clay Elm, Washington. Um, I live outside of a population 2K town, right? So oh. I, li I live in the middle of motherfucking nowhere. Yeah. And this is where I've been ever since. And so this year I got extraordinarily focused. Like last winter I was putting in, you know, six, eight hours a day, eight days, eight days a week, six days a week um, on my business, building out these systems and processes to help healers build their own businesses, to put money into the hands of the people with the biggest hearts. That has been the mission since day one. I've had some ups and downs. I can't say that, you know, every single one of my clients has been successful, though we have experienced quite a bit of success within the program. But this has always been my vision and it has continued to be my vision. And as we are scaling upward and upward, and now I'm like, my new goal is to be the greatest, to be some, you know, when you think of becoming a spiritual coach, becoming a healer within the coaching industry, whatever like that, like you think of Kevin Chin, it's synonymous. You're like, okay, that's, that's the guy. Mm. It's that fucking hair and that fucking smile. Like I'm going to <laughs> Kevin, it's that fucking guy. And yeah. Yeah, all of that is to say wow. that like that that is still the vision to put money into the hands of the people with the biggest hearts so that we can start making changes on this planet. Wow. That's some ambition, bro. I like that. See, this is why this is why I like admire and respect you because you like you think big. And um how like I don't even know what question I want to ask right now. Yeah, oh actually no, I do want to ask this. So Throughout this whole journey, you know, what do you think has been the key to your success? Self-love and self-belief. To understand that even on my worst days, it's still, I'm still worth it. It's, it's never fruitful to give up on myself and I am always worth giving a second chance. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's been the key determining factor. Cause I mean, we've conducted like extensive market research on people who aren't my clients as well as even deeper research on my clients. And the single greatest factor in determining someone's success is their, their, their belief in themselves, which stems from their decision to succeed. Right. If you're on the fence of like, you know, I kind of want to do this. Maybe I'll do this. It sounds really awesome. I think I could be good at this. I would love to do this type shit. That's, not going to cut it. You need to move into a space of like, this is the next step for me. Maybe I'm not going to do this forever, but I'm going to do it until it works. I'm not going to fail. That's not an option. I'm unavailable for failure. And mm. then that's the moment when it all clicks because everything just starts lining up for you. You stop, you stop approaching the day with resistance of like, shit, can I do it? Can I not do it? You know, maybe I'll procrastinate and it won't, you know, type shit. It's just like, no, I'm just doing it. I'm yeah. just doing it. There's, there's no, there's no wasted energy there. And so the decisiveness is the determining factor. And I think the decisiveness, the root of that is loving yourself and understanding that you are worthy of your desires coming true, of your dreams coming true. You're worthy of accomplishing your vision. And so then the decision to do it becomes easy because if you know that you're worthy of it, it's like, am I going to do it? Am I not going to do it? It's like, fuck yeah, I'm going to do it. What are some of the, uh, the mistakes or like the traps that new coaches you know, fall into when they get started? Yeah. So for sure, the biggest mistake is trying to do it by yourself. This year alone, I've invested probably $40,000 in my own coaching. And like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to grow at the rate that I have without it point blank period. There's no, there's no way around it. And I think that a lot of people, they see coaching as different than every other field. Cause let's be real. You don't become a lawyer without law school. You don't become a doctor without medical school, like you don't become a karate master without a fucking mentor. And yet people step into the coaching space and they're like, it's my authentic expression. I need to do it on my own. It's like, yeah, it's your fucking authentic expression. But like Vincent Van Gogh had a mentor, right? Like, no, you don't, you don't recreate the wheel. There's no point. You're not going to be competitive with the rest of the market if you're trying to do it on your own. And that doesn't mean that you can't do it in a very unique way. It doesn't mean that you, you know, follow anybody else's model, but until you understand, like, 
you can't change the game unless you know the rules, right? And it, that's the way it is for everything, not just coaching. And so I think the biggest mistake that people make is feeling like they have to do it by themselves and feeling like they can't do anything that anybody else is doing. That's a Picasso quote, right? Like good artists borrow and great artists steal. Interesting. I don't know how I feel about that, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's real. I mean, the, the truth is, and this goes back to like songwriting too. The truth is you could completely copy somebody else's work, right? Like I could take John Mayer's album and just recreate it, do my absolute best to recreate it. And it still wouldn't be John Mayer's album. It would still be my album, right? Because it's me and it's my expression. It's my voice. It's the vibrations that exist within my skeleton yeah. coming out. So it's like people get so afraid to do what others are doing that they like back off from things that are working, right? Or they get so concerned with what everybody else is doing. That, that would be mistake number two is the opposite. They get so concerned with what everybody else is doing that they try to just emulate everybody else and they don't think about like, is this even in alignment mm. with me? Does this resonate with like what I'm really here to do? So yeah, I would, I would actually say, uh, this is a good question because I never really thought about the second one. Um, those are the two biggest mistakes. Being so afraid to be like a, every other people that you're turning away good ideas just because other people are having success with them and being so afraid to be unique that you're not mm. following your own intuition because you're trying to just do, you know, follow somebody else's path. Yeah. So it's almost like this this balance, right, of the two, kind of marrying those. I like that. So when it comes to this you know, stuff about like frequency, law of attraction, all these things, there's a lot of advice out there, right? In your experience, and this is something I'm I'm I've been working through, and I guess I am on some level still working through. What do you think is the the balance between say i like you talked about hey we just attract what we are right mm -hmm. so you just be a miracle what's the difference between simply just attracting those things versus just taking massive action and like almost like trying to like like just making it happen you know because it seems like you kind of have to have both right like how do we reconcile those two yeah so you can call it law of attraction you can call it psycho cybernetics you can call it like being essence of being you can call it like gravity for all i care like <laughs> it doesn't really matter there's two basic premises that need to be in place for any of this stuff to work in your own life number one is everything is energy if you don't accept that everything is energy then you don't fit into the rest of the puzzle right there's some pieces that are puzzle pieces and some pieces that are water bottles right and you can't put a puzzle together with some puzzle pieces and some water bottles, right? So you have to sure. accept that everything is energy. You have to accept that the water bottle is at some level, a bunch of pieces of puzzles put together. Does that make sense? Yeah, like it's its own thing, I guess, frequency, right? And then like the puzzle piece. The but ultimately, puzzle. it's it is not its own thing. They're all Dude. atoms. And it's all energy. Right? Okay, like got, it's you, all, got you. It's all yeah. just like, and it's everything that is, is made up of the same things. Me, my voice, my thoughts, my emotions, as it comes out of my mouth and goes into the microphone and gets converted into electricity that is broadcast digitally through StreamYard, shouts out and coming out on it through your headphones. It's all A, energy and B, the same energy, right? And so when you really like, conceptualize and then practice the conception until it becomes a point of experience, you get the sensation of oneness. And once you have the sensation of oneness, you realize that like, that's how, again, law of attraction, psycho cybernet cybernetics, um, gravity, like it's all, it all just works like that because it is all frequency and it's all one frequency. Or like, you know, di different, I, I kind of explained that improperly, different frequencies of the same energy like universal consciousness is really what it is like different manifestations of the same thing different drops of water in the same ocean got you got you so when when it comes to say like creating a business and uh taking action would you say that like taking action is uh like a maybe like a certain frequency that we have to emulate if we are to create a business yeah, so back to your question in terms of like taking action, it's like 
once you understand that premise and then the other premise beyond everything is energy is you know you ask yourself the question over and over and over a thousand times a day for a whole year do i create my own reality right and then once you once you really like lock into that and you're like yes i do create my own reality with those two premises down like the world is yours and this is what christ talked about this is what buddha talked about this is what like every great spiritual teacher has talked about right and they describe it in different ways so they can describe it in faith they can describe it in stillness they can describe but whatever it's like they're all talking about the same thing which is the same as law of attraction right that's just a new term for like some old shit. So when it comes to starting a business or making your dream come true, um, I think a good way to describe this would be to use a different analogy other than starting your business. And then we can move back into that if you like. But let's say your dream is to climb Half Dome, right? And I just use this because it's a little more like visual. It's a little more tangible. Starting a business has like a lot of moving parts, whereas like climbing to the top of Half Dome, like, you know, from a, from a general perspective, like it's point A to point B, right? Um, so if your dream is to climb to the top of half dome, you could and should sit around and see it, visualize it. Okay. Here's me climbing up. Like I'm overcoming it. I'm getting stronger. I'm reaching the top. Oh my God. I feel so good. Right. So you're getting in the vibration of the you that climbs half dome. You're becoming that person. Then you should also be training physically to climb half dome. So your mm -hmm. mind is there as well as your body is there at the gym. Then you should also also be climbing fucking half dome. If your dream is to climb half dome, you're not going to climb half dome without climbing half dome. Again, I'm telling you, like I, I tend to make these things simpler than, you know, people no, have no, previously no. made them. But no, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I think the analogies do help. Right. Yeah. No, so if we that. bring it, if we bring it back to like starting a business now that, you know, we have this, this framework simplified a little bit, it's like, yes, you do need to see yourself as a successful entrepreneur. If you don't see yourself as a successful entrepreneur, you're not going to attract the right opportunities into your life. And even if you do come across them, you're going to get scared away, right? Like you start selling shoes and you're like, nobody's going to want these shoes. Nobody wants these shoes. Nobody wants these shoes. You walk by someone on the street who needs your shoes. You don't pitch to them. Or they even mm. come to you and you're like, I'm afraid to sell these to you because I don't I don't think that they're valuable. Or I don't see myself as, as worthy of it, whatever. Right. So you have to work on shifting your perspective of yourself. Like you could call it first, you could call it second, whatever. That all of these things need to happen because you have to shift it yourself. And you also have to take the action. You have to sell the fucking shoes if you want the shoes to be sold, because I could sit on the couch all day and be like, Mm, I'm selling shoes. I feel so good. I'm a successful entrepreneur. And then I open my eyes and it's like, wait a minute, I still have a 10,000 boxes of shoes sitting in my living room. I need to get these shoes sold. Right. But when you couple the two together, that's when things really start to happen. I heard a really good quote the other day. Fuck, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's like um, something along the lines of like energetic alignment plus action equals miracles. Something like that. And I think that that's the truth. Um, the point as far as law of attraction, I'm going to, I'm going to do this again too. Like, cause I know there's a lot of people watching this that have probably studied law of attraction for years and are like, I still don't know exactly how I'm going to, I'm going to break it down for you in one sentence. You are always a vibrational match for something. You are always broadcasting a signal and that signal that you are broadcasting is always resonating and attracting something to you. You can never turn it off. The game never stops. So when you really understand that, and again, conceptualize it first and then experience it, you realize that like, it's always happening. You know, when you're living in a state of fear, you're attracting more fear. When you're living in a state of anger, you're attracting more anger. But when you're living in a state of gratitude and happiness, you're attracting more abundance. And it's okay to be mad. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to do this stuff. You just have to be aware of what you're attracting. I get fucking pissed off all the time. It still happens. I'm still human. But it's like I might be pissed off for six hours and then spend six days in gratitude, right? And that's because mm. I choose that I want more gratitude in my life. So when I catch myself getting angry, it's not a matter of, well, she was wrong and I'm right. Or I can't believe that he did this or this is not the way that it should be. It's what am I attracting into my life right now? And what do I really want? Do I want more anger? Okay, well, then I should stop being angry. So, um, how do I want to ask this? When you talk about, you know, like self-love, 
um, being worthy of your goal and shifting your identity. What are some of the things that you tell your clients that, that help them do that thing? Is it simply just, as you talked about previously, you know, you, you kind of change your language, you start to reframe things and go up the scale? Yeah, so there's like a lot of different systematic processes. We rework the vocabulary, we use EFT, we use subliminals, we use hypnosis, we use theta healing, we use all sorts of different modalities. But ultimately, it is always going to come down to like, here's one thing that you can take away from this. And uh, like, I don't, I'm not going to be like, uh, like mystical and secretive about it. Like, oh, we have all these things and you're never going to be successful if you don't do this. If you do this, you don't need my program, right? What my program exists for is to help you help facilitate the, the proper and consistent doing of this inner work. So the inner work is this number one, what do I want? Let's say I want a red Ferrari, right? Number two, what says I can't have this? Uh, I can't have this because everybody who owns a Ferrari is a douchebag and I don't want to be a douchebag. Number three, is this ultimately true? And the hint here is it's not. It's never ultimately true. If you think you can't have a million dollars, if you think you can't have the partner of your dreams, if you think you can't climb Mount Kilimanjaro, ultimately it's not true. Ultimately, nothing is true. It's all fucking relative. I learned that when I was 11 years old and I smoked weed for the first time, right? <laughs> so ultimately nothing is true. We get to decide what's true for us. So then step three is deciding, well, you know, my friend Neil has a Ferrari and he's not a douchebag. So clearly not everybody with a Ferrari is douchebag. Clearly, if I could, if I got a Ferrari, I could opt to not be a douchebag, right? You stick your foot in the door of, of possibility, right? Yeah. So then step four is what's, a feeling that feels better, right? What's a thought, what's an emotion, what's a belief that is gonna serve me better than, I can't have a Ferrari because everybody who owns a Ferrari is a douchebag and I don't wanna be a douchebag. So a better feeling thought would be like, I have a Ferrari and everybody loves me. Fuck yeah, it feels good just saying it, right? I have a Ferrari and I am now changing people's perception of Ferrari owners because I'm so the opposite of a douchebag. Like I'm such a good guy that now people, people uh, associate Ferraris with awesome people, right? And then step five, final step, embody that vibration. So that person who has a Ferrari and is awesome and is changing people's perceptions of Ferrari owners because he's just that awesome, how does he act? How does he think? What kind of thoughts run through his head on a day-to-day -day basis? How does he carry himself day-to-day? -day? How does he treat other people? How does he allow other people to treat him? What are his boundaries around his time and energy? What does he eat? When does he sleep? Where does he go? Like all this different mm -hmm. kind of stuff, right? When I talk about like changing your frequency, like it sounds like esoteric and like, oh my God, how do I change my frequency? Like you change your frequency by fucking everything that you do and think and feel and are, right? That's how you change your frequency. So you just have to get really deeply in touch with your ideal self. In this example, it would be that Ferrari owner, right? You have to get in touch with that Ferrari owner. And you can do that through journaling. You can do that through contemplation and reflection. You can do that through meditation. You can do that through hanging out with Ferrari owners, right? Like, you know, surround yourself with the success of the people who have what you want, all that stuff. There's infinite different ways to do different things. And that's what I'm saying. It's like in my program, mm -hmm. we cover all these different things. And that's why it's valuable. But I'm going to tell you right here, that's the fucking key. That's the core component is you need to be able to sh shift your beliefs. You need to be able to shift your beliefs about who you are and the world around you and where you fit into it. And when you, you again, you realize that everything is the, a puzzle made of the same pieces and that you as a conscious being are the one who's putting the piece, the puzzle pieces together then you just put the puzzle pieces together exactly as whatever you want to build. You make it sound easy, man. <laughs> Which is probably what you're trying to go for, right? Just that's like, what I'm trying to go for. Poke, I think, poke some people, poke me, you know, yeah. I think that ultimately that's what I'm here to do is to just to demystify life, demystify what is behind the veil. I mean, a lot of people, uh, my girlfriend especially, always talks about like, you know, society is just tells us these things to try to keep us down. And I think that like, you know, a big part of my mission here is to say like, Shh, we don't, we don't have to be mad at society. Just like choose a different perspective and carry on from there. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, 
Are you familiar with like Neville Goddard and Fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I've been getting into his stuff and um and by the way, how how are you on time before I, I ask this? Oh, I'm set, dude. I'm this is my last thing for the day. Cool, cool. All right. So all, all I want to do is go ride my bike later, get some sun, sunlight, because it's supposed to rain for the next week straight. Oh, but yeah? I'm, I'm totally good on time. If we if we take another however long, I'm cool. We'll get out of here. Okay. We should be, it should be soon. 26 minutes max, and then we'll, we'll count it. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. It, it should be before then. But um, so so there's this concept of everyone is you pushed out, and I'm sure you've heard of that, right? I'm curious on your thoughts on that and what that entails. If say like we're looking at society and like man society is holding us back and, and whatever like I I say this shit all the time right and uh, yeah so you could say everyone is you pushed out you could say every person in your life is a reflection of you you could say that the external is always an, an mirror image of the internal you could say as above so below as within so without like these are all again they're all the same teachings like Neville Goddard is what early twentieth century it's yeah. like Jesus said this stuff like 2000 years ago, like Siddhartha said this stuff like 8000 years ago, like it's it's truly all the same teachings expressed in different languages in different ways. So that, you know, more and more people can start to get it because we all speak different languages and understand things differently. Um, but to come back to this original, like everyone is you pushed out. Yeah, I mean, sometimes ask me a more specific question. Sometimes I have <laughs> I have trouble even going into this stuff because I'm I like yeah dude like what do you like what do you want like, yeah yeah i'm obviously I'm, yeah i'm trying to figure out what my specific question is i guess what is um what is everyone you pushed out because is it that you are me and i am you and you're just some part of my psyche you know that's showing up right or um i think because some people can take it to an extreme and say maybe like everyone is just a figment of my imagination you know go like full-on solipsism if you're familiar with that you know like how do we how do we conceptualize this i guess or how do you conceptualize it how do you understand it yeah and thank you for phrasing it like that at the end because i truthfully believe in everybody's truth right if you believe something it's real to you like cool it's real to me as as your reality hmm. um in my reality everything is one it's all connected we are all the same thing um i made this meme one time there you like pokemon i mean i used to <laughs> i was like this guy's asian of course he likes pokemon um Racist. but there, there's like this <laughs> there's like this <laughs> meme thank you for calling me out on it uh there's this meme that's like uh it shows like diglets there's like five diglets and oh yeah i've seen that one yeah. see that one it's but it's a, a one like massive diglet underground it's just like the five fingers that is truthfully how I see all of us, right? We are born into these different bodies in these different families as different people, but we are ultimately all one consciousness in the same way that those diglets, like each of these fingers is part of Kevin, right? Mm. But each of these Kevins is part of consciousness. And so we, we have these different labels like Justin and Kevin and mom and dad and brother, sister, friend, family. And that's exactly like, you know, one of, one of the things that like, my girlfriend's talking about when she says like society conditions us to to think certain things like society conditions us to think that we are separate individual entities when we are not in the same way that like my liver is not a separate entity from my heart yes they form different functions but they intrinsically work together and we they can't work apart right they're, they're part of the same whole yes just like gotcha. we are all part of the same whole got you man um last question if if you can go back in time and give advice to a younger Kevin, what would you say? Holy fuck. <laughs> um, damn, that's deep, man. If I could go back to a younger Kevin, I would say, I think so. There's this like another like, thing that I want to be famous for is to, is being somebody who has no regrets. I want it to be publicly known. I'll say it right now. My biggest regret in life is not going to see My Chemical Romance on the Black Parade Tour and not going to see AFI on the December Underground Tour, right? If those are your biggest regrets in life, you're living a pretty good life, right? And so I, yeah. I have always tried to follow 
the path of least resistance, which I believe is the path of least regret, right? You follow your intuition, you follow your heart, you make a lot of messes, you clean up, you say a lot of sorries, but like you keep doing what you feel is right to you. And it gets more and more iterated into like a path that's good for everybody. Um, so if I were to go back and give advice to myself, I would just like, I would say, look at me, right? Like, look at me. I'm an older version of you. We made it. Mm. You didn't die. You like you, you don't have to be afraid. It's going to be okay. And even if you are afraid, that's okay, right? But like, here's proof, right? Because I had points in my life where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, I've, I've been, I kind of omitted this from like the, the storyline but like any any of those gaps between things like especially after like some of these monumental deaths like there was like massive depression there was a lot of points in my life where like i was on um anti-anxiety or anti-depression medication i was like suicidal at times too and like you know if i could do it all over again i would just reduce the amount of time that i spent afraid that i wasn't gonna make it to the next day or afraid that i was gonna mm be sad forever or anything like that. And so I would tell myself like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I love that. I think I would say the same thing to me. It's going to be okay. You know, I like that. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do anything differently. I would just, you know, I would just try to feel, feel better about it. Yeah. Reduce the suffering, the, the unnecessary suffering. And I think that that's like, such a monumental question too, because it's like, like I'm 29. I think you're roughly the same yeah, age. Yeah, I'm 29 like, as well. Yep. Perfect. Imagine like our 60, 70, 80 year old selves coming back to us right now. It's, I mean, maybe that's what this conversation is, right? But like, <laughs> imagine them coming back and so, telling us the same thing. Like, it's going to be okay. Right. Like, mm. I'm, I have day to day worries. I have worries about like, you know, taxes and like, you know, relationships and stuff like that. And what if like, you know, this version of me came to me and just said, like, dude, it's cool. You you handled your taxes that year and every year after. You handled your relationships. Everything worked out fine. Like it's all love, yeah. man. Wow, that's powerful, dude. Well, on that note, um, how can people work with you or contact you if they want to work with you? Yeah. So the best way to get a hold of me, um, you can add me on Facebook. Uh, you can add me on Instagram. You can go to www.kevinchin.com. Um, oh. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of different channels. I can I can link um because this is on your Facebook page, right? Yeah, yeah. If you can send me those links, I will add those in the description. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. I'll send you my socials and yeah, my DMs are always open on every channel. If there's anything that you want to talk about, honestly, the best way, because sometimes I don't, you know, Facebook's weird. If you're not friends with somebody, it gets put in like a different folder. Yeah. Um, the best way to get my attention would be to comment on one of my posts because I will personally see all of those. Got it. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for, for coming on. I, I think this was a really good conversation, man. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. I haven't done one yeah. of these interviews in like two or three months and you know, you hit me up and I was just like, <laughs> fuck yeah, dude, there's nobody I would rather do an interview with. So thank you so much for having me. Everybody watching. I hope that this has been valuable. If you're watching the replay, like welcome to my past. Justin, you're the man. Um, you, I hope you. that our stories always run parallel. Same. All right. Peace out, guys. Later.